Welcome to Pointy End. I'm Keith Sutherland. Today my guest is Ian Tullock, political commentator and expert. So Ian, welcome. Good morning, Keith. Now it's getting very exciting that we've got the first week of the campaign, of our eight-week campaign, and none of us are bored to death. Well, maybe some of us are. But anyway, what's your um, suggestions on how the first week has gone for the leaders, and then we'll go into some of the policies that are not quite coming through at this point in time. Now, because it's such a long campaign, uh, both leaders have to uh, uh, take their time in terms of uh, uh, announcing new, uh, new measures, new policies. And so we saw uh, Bill Shorten for most of the first week in northern Queensland, where Labor has to win uh, probably three seats. They have to win probably another seven or eight in New South Wales, uh, three in Tassie, Solomon in the Northern Territory, O'Connor in WA, and maybe Hindmarsh in South Australia. So they have to, w they have to win probably 19 seats uh, to get into government, and that's a fairly tall order. It's a big order, that's for sure. And as well as Deakin in Victoria, and maybe Corangamite, so uh, uh, without losing any of their own seats. So uh, Shorten was in Northern Queensland uh, for a, almost a whole week. Uh, uh, the Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull's been all over the place. He's been uh, uh, even Victoria, he's been in New South Wales, he's been in Sydney, Western Sydney in particular, where it's really important for uh, the government to retain a number of those uh, vulnerable seats uh, in Western Sydney, which is uh, a very volatile uh, electorate. Yeah, particularly, uh, and also he was in Adelaide, of course, trying to support mm. um, Christopher Pine because lots of announcements on what was happening prior to the election with the shipbuilding, etc. The one that's been a big surprise to me at the sandbagging of a seat was in Eden Monaro with um, Dr. Peter Hendy. Now it's quite amazing that one because you've seen Malcolm Turnbull's supporters supporting him, but you've seen none of Tony Abbott's because they've wiped him of course because he changed sides. But that's the one you see Peter Hendy in the background of most media um, items that go on in New South Wales. It was just every day I, I noticed one of the cabinet ministers there trying to support him. So. They seem to be really worried about Eden Monaro for some well, it's, reason. It's, it's a classic bellwether seat. As we, uh, for, we since see. I think it's 1972, it's uh, always gone uh, to the government of the day. Uh, uh, along with Lindsay, I think. Lindsay's also done the same thing for the last uh, uh, five or six elections. And Reid, they're, they're there as well. And just incredible how they are. And that's what they're doing is obviously sandbagging. I understand there's 32 marginal electorates across the country. so. Obviously, that's where the, the leaders and both sides of politics are going to spend their time on those 32 marginal electorates. Yeah, so if, if there was a 3.8% swing to Labor, uh, both uh, uniform swing, both sides would have 73 seats and there'd be four independents uh, Andrew Wilkie, Bob Catter, Adam, Adam Bant, and uh, Cathy McGowan if she wins Indi. Uh, so. What about Tony Windsor? Well, I, th I think he's got an outside chance, but only an, an outside chance uh, okay. in, in New England. Uh, a Deputy Prime Minister's never lost a seat. Uh, mm. So Barnaby Joyce has got, uh, has, has got uh, that in his favour. Uh, I think um, Windsor's got only an outside chance. OK. Well, he must be pretty confident about it because he's in Bendigo today, Barnaby Joyce and the Tuca. Um, and, of course, we'll come to it. The, um, the Nationals have announced a candidate for Bendigo, but we'll finish off with that. At this early stage, you've seen some campaigning. We'll come to some of the issues that haven't really come to the fore. But um, you were mentioning the number of seats that they need to get. Are you prepared to sort of make a stab in the dark at this point? I know lots going to happen over the next seven weeks of the campaign. Yeah, um, what's your thoughts with at this point? With six or so weeks to go, uh, I still think it's uh, for Turnbull to lose the election uh, and for Labor to win it. Um, usually governments lose elections uh, if the opposition's competent, and they are competent. There's no doubt that Bill Shorten stepped up in, in the last uh, several months in terms of his uh, uh, policy, new policy uh, formation and his own image. Uh, but it's a tall order, I think, to win uh, maybe 16 or 17 seats with the backing of maybe three of those independents uh, to form government. And it's a, and it's a first... I mean, the, first uh, for both of them. Yeah, uh, it's the first time they've, they've campaigned as leaders of their respective parties in an election campaign. And, but uh, the coalition's only been in power for three years. Yeah. It's been a bit of a surprise package to me because I think when Malcolm Turnbull was um, elected, everyone thought things will change, he'll do a terrific job. But he's been quite disappointing. 
Bill Shorten has been a bit of a surprise, doing better, but he's not mm. um, aggressive enough or something about him. Just um, on those issues from, say, from last week, it's noticing it was jobs and growth from Malcolm Turnbull, and Malcolm Turnbull and Bill Shorten seem to be running presidential campaign. Um, Bill Shorten was all about education last week. This week, um, Malcolm Turnbull was in Western Australia, shipbuilding, um, ALP, they said they did nothing for six years, and I was probably right. But Bill Shorten has been on the transition from the car industry, and in Victoria gave $59 million package down at Geelong to try and transition some of those car industry workers to other areas. So they're the only two things that have sort of been coming through. But as you said before, not much in the way of policy. Uh, and that, we'll see more of that because so the campaign uh, launches won't be until probably the second last week of, the of this really long campaign. Um, I think uh, there was a, uh, a debate uh, in Western Sydney um, in the seat of Lindsay last Friday evening. Uh, but all, uh, the audience, 100 undecided voters, overwhelmingly thought that Shorten won that debate. Now that's given him a fair degree of momentum. So now we've seen what I see is, is an, in, an incredibly uh, uh, ordinary attack, I think, uh, uh, on the Labor Party over asylum seeker and I issues. And uh, I mean, Peter Dutton, for example, has come out and said some quite <laughs> outrageous things. He did it again this morning. Uh, yeah, but saying that uh, uh, if the asylum seekers on the Roo or Manus Island are settled in Australia, they're, they're illiterate and they'll take Australian jobs. Now that xenophobic type of attack uh, was, was suited the Abbott, the Abbott government That's and right. Abbott's style of leadership. So uh, tactically, uh, I think uh, uh, the people behind the scenes are encouraging Dutton to do that. Right. So Thank it's a return, in a sense, to an Abbott style uh, uh, attack on the Labor Party because they are really worried. Well, there's no doubt that the reality was that Tony um, Abbott was a great campaigner. Uh, slogans, 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 and he stuck to the policy. Um, and at the moment, Malcolm Turnbull hasn't been able to get that traction. And they said the other day from that debate you referred to, 43 to 29. So there's a big difference there, if you're to believe those. But coming back to some of those things, and you mentioned this number of seats and so on. Now, I listened to Anthony Green the other night, and he said that Liberal National Party, this is coming to the Senate, and I want to talk to you about a Senate issue. Um, 35 seats, and he doesn't believe there'll be any change. ALP and Greens will be 37. Xenophon, three in South Australia. Family First and Lazarus, maybe. Um, so he doesn't believe there'll be, um, they still need that 39 minimum. Now, coming back to Victoria, after our interview this morning, I'm doing an interview with Mark Dickinson, who is a Senate, independent Senate candidate for Victoria. What is his real realistic chances? Because we've seen the changes to the voting, six above the line, you can still do whatever you wanted to do below the line, but the chances of an independent without the Glenn Jury seat, um, preference whisperer, what's his real chances? And I'd like to be able to put this to Mark after our interview this morning. Well, quite, to be quite frank, uh, virtually nil. Uh, an independent candidate in, in a Senate election, of, with, despite the fact that it's a, a double dissolution where you've got only half the, the, the normal numbers, quota. Yeah. Uh, you have to be a high profile person uh, in the community. Uh, so Darren Hench, no hope either? I don't think so. Uh, and even some of the incumbents who are, of course, uh, uh, quite well known, they're going to lose their seats too. And even Bob Day will probably lose his seat uh, in, in South Australia. So I think, I think Mark, uh, I know it's a good experience for people, I think, to stand, uh, stand for, for the parliament. But uh, realistically, uh, very little uh, chance in thinking he may, may not even get his de deposit, deposit back. Okay, well, I'll put that to him. And, but he's got some terrific ideas and some of his initiatives are, I think will gel with the community, but you've got to get your message out and party machine behind it, pretty tough going. Anyway, um, the other day I also read that um, there's a lot of young people still haven't registered and we're running out of time. So what's your thought on that? Is it people should be registering, of course, um, is it the 23rd of this month have to register? And is that going to affect either party that the younger people haven't signed up to vote at this election? This is something I'm quite concerned about. Uh, those who aren't on the rolls have till the 23rd of May to get on the rolls. Uh, but there's a, a, there are hundreds of thousands of uh, people that aren't on the rolls. 
uh, mostly young people between the ages of 18 and 24. A considerable proportion of, uh, of those hundreds of thousands of people uh, are young people. Now the impact of this, if they were enrolled and they were voting, uh, the research shows that about 60% of those vote, would vote Labor or Greens. So it disadvantages uh, both those parties, and particularly the Labor Party, that, that the fact that they aren't on the rolls. Okay. Um, from your point of view and observation, and you study it closer than most of us, has there been any standout performers at this point in time? As I said, I made my comments on both the leaders, and um, Malcolm, I, I think, has been disappointing. Bill Shorten has been a bit of a surprise, but it's a long way to go. Um, Malcolm Turnbull is still changing on things. You saw with the um, um, workers, itinerant workers and things like that. They've changed policy on that and they just they have a policy for two days, a Liberal National Party, drop it and go. But has there been anyone stand out in the campaign to date? And as I said, it has been a presidential mm -hmm. campaign. All you see is the two leaders. The rest of the um, members of the parties don't get a look in much, mostly these days. I think it's pretty even at this stage. Uh I don't think there's been any... Uh, no uh, gaffes. Uh, there's been some gaffes on both sides. Uh, well, the Labor Party had to dump their Fremantle candidate, yeah. for example. And, uh, but I mean the leaders themselves haven't really made any stuff-ups along the way, but there's been things within the party machines that have been very awkward for both sides. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's pretty even. Uh, there's been no outstanding uh, performances uh, from either side, I don't think. Uh, and uh, either the polls are, are, are even. Okay. Uh, Labor's probably just ahead in the news poll uh, and the latest essential poll, 51.49, but uh, uh, they need a substantial swing. Uh, and uh, uh, six weeks to go, uh, that's a long, long time for, for either side uh, to, uh, to uh, make a decisive move. And I think uh, on, in, in terms of policy, uh, the campaign has been pretty negative so far. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, Get, getting those swinging voters to vote for you, you need to be positive, not just uh, not just negative. Uh, and uh, we'll see those policies uh, come out over the next few weeks, I think. Yep. Going back to the polls, you mentioned that um, it was interesting. The Morgan poll this week was 52.5 for Labor, 47.5 for Liberal National Party. The essential poll yesterday came out 49.51, which to me would suggest that's probably fairly accurate or close to 50.50. Is that your feel, because you have a close-up affinity with where the polls are at, is that your feel at the moment, this well, early stage? Well, the polls, the polls have been uh, at about this level for a couple of months now. And so you need to look at the trend. One poll by itself is, uh, uh, is not, you, you cannot rely on one poll because you need to look at the trend. And it's been, uh, Labor's just been ahead for a couple of months now. Uh, uh, and. And in the campaign, uh, each, each side will, will be uh, designing their policies to come out just before that polling happens. Uh, we see this all the time. Yeah. Uh, so it'll be cat and mouse game. Fair enough. Yeah. Now, a couple of issues that I think are sleepers, and I may be wrong because I'm passionate about both of them. One is negative gearing um, with Labor's proposal to have it on new houses as from July next year. The other one is NBN because to me, that's a big sleeper in this community. It's been swept under the car carpet and you won't see anything in the Murdoch media other than derision towards the Labor policy on that one. But they're two issues that I am passionate about. Are they going to have any impact along the way or is that just my thoughts because I'm, I am strong about both of them or is that going to have an impact? Because negative gearing, we've seen Malcolm Turnbull and Treasurer Scott Morrison really ridicule Labor's policy but all the experts, John Daly and Sean, uh, Sean Eastwake, are all saying the opposite. So are they issues or not, or is that just in my head? I think for the ordinary voter, uh, I think uh, it plays into Labor's hands, uh, their policy on negative gearing, because uh, the ordinary voter knows that uh, people on average incomes uh, uh, find it extremely difficult to, to, uh, to have an investment property and to negatively gear it. Despite, and so that's why we've seen the scare campaign uh, from the government uh, uh, saying, well, there are a lot of uh, ordinary voters, um, ordinary taxpayers that do negatively gear. But if you actually look at some of these figures, I mean, you've, you've, got, uh, you've got people who are uh, shop assistants, people who are receptionists, uh, 
in the figures who, who have got uh, losses on their investment properties. Uh, but their incomes aren't high enough, you wouldn't think, uh, for them to get a loan to actually purchase a, a property like that. So, so the reality is that their partner or their husband or wife uh, is a high income earner. Uh, and that's and they share they share the loss, uh, and so the government's been incredibly disingenuous, I think, uh, in this scare campaign, and I think it will play into Shorten's hands because the average taxpayer, the average voter, knows that uh, it's the high income earners that are benefiting from that. So it is middle class welfare. Yeah. Um, just on that issue, I was reading, and I've gone through it very closely because I'm uh, speaking at a seminar tomorrow about negative gearing. But the average loss is around about eight and a half, nine thousand dollars per property, and that equates to about two thousand nine hundred less tax that the government gets. Grattan are saying it's five point three billion dollars to the bottom line, and we've heard about debt and deficit, um, but no one seems to be really rubbing that home because to me that's a lot of money with negative gearing losses and also the capital gains tax reduction from fifty to twenty five percent. So that's why I've felt all along that this has to be a sleeper. And your point, I think, is quite rightly made that that's the partners of high income earners, whether it be husband, wife, it's the partners that are in these and um, loss making. And it's OK for they say about it, but it's also the rest of us $310 per person that we are paying it's to subsidise negative gearers. And that's going to have an impact, I think, going through the campaign. If you troll through the figures, which I have, uh, those that are making the largest losses are the highest income earners. Um, and surgeons, surgeons, surgeons anesthetists, doctors, <laughs> dentists. Uh, dentists. Yeah. Mm. yeah, no, that's really interesting. We'll bring it back finally to the local campaign and we've just noticed that um, the Nationals have appointed um, Andy M Madison, stock and station agent from Lockington, as their candidate. So now we have four candidates for the seat of Bendigo. What's the feedback you're getting? Is Lisa still in front? Megan Purcell has been interviewed by Dennis on this program twice, and um, but um, Lisa's been out there, she's the incumbent. Does that mean that she's probably still in front? And what's your thoughts? And of course, you've got the Greens, and they, according to the latest poll, they're slightly increasing their vote nationally, slightly. I think there was a huge swing against Labor uh, in 2013, and in Bendigo, a large swing, a, a very large swing. So I think there's going to be what I call a natural correction back to Labor, um, uh, and the polls sh are showing that, uh, three or four percent different to last time. So I think uh, Lisa Chester's got very little chance of losing the seat. She's uh, way in front, I think. Um, so the Labor Party should spend their money trying to win Deakin and Corangamite rather than to shore up a, a seat like uh, Bendigo or some of the Ballarat, or Ballarat, for example. Well, we're not going to see much this time around because I believed it was Greg Bickley had about a million dollars, if that's um, true, at the last election to spend on their campaign, whereas Labor had about 150 or something like that. So this time around, you won't expect to see too many of the leaders coming to town, I wouldn't think, over the next seven weeks of the campaign. Uh, I, I wouldn't think Lisa Chester has a chance of losing. Okay. Uh, I think she's, uh, she'll win by at least 5%. Well, that's um, a pretty strong endorsement coming from someone like yourself that understands uh, the machinations of the whole political scene. And I think the demographics play into Labor's favour as well. And if there's the seat, particularly the southern areas of the seat, where there's a, a really strong green vote, and 80% of that flows back to Labor. So all those uh, demographic changes, uh, the tree changes and the people who have shifted out of the city, uh, into the southern parts of the seat of Bendigo, uh, I think that does favour that does favour Labor, uh, and um, I can't see uh, uh, any chance of uh, Lisa Chester's losing. Um, now the National Party candidate, uh, that his preferences will obviously go to the Liberals. Yep. Um, but compared to say two elections ago, when when we had a, uh, a huge National Party swing on on, a, because we had a uh, a quite uh, popular National Party candidate. Uh, this chap's uh, not not well known in the community, That's uh, right. so uh, I wouldn't expect the National Party vote to be more than uh, three or four percent. Well, finally, there were, I should have said um, the seat of Murray is interesting. That Damien Drum, local um, member for the Upper House in the state of Victoria, uh, from what feedback I'm getting is he's a very strong chance in Murray, 
but um, Dr Sharman Stone has now retired. We've got the Liberal Party have put a candidate in, Donald Magecki's son, um, and we've got Damien Drummer's endorsed um, National Party. Um, Barnaby Joyce is in town to support him today, Tuca and beyond. So the feedback I'm getting is that Damien's in with a very big chance of winning that seat. Of course, it's going to be a two-corner contest because Liberals and Nationals, because um, the uh, candidate has now retired. So have you got any feedback on that one at all? I think he's got a good chance. Uh, but if you look at the history of uh, seats that have gone from the Nats to the Libs, uh, with uh, like Murray um, and Tim Fisher's uh, former seat uh, on the other side of Albury, uh, once they go from the Nats to the Libs, the Liberals usually retain them forever, or okay. al almost forever. Uh, whereas if an independent wins a seat from a Nat, there's a, a good chance it'll go back to the Nats, uh, like like what happened in East Gippsland in, in the state election. Uh, so uh, I think I think Damien Drum's got a good chance. Um, but... Uh, You're more and, cautious and, in the feedback I'm getting at. Yeah, I, I would say it's probably a 50-50 chance. I wouldn't say that he's favourite at this stage. OK. Well, Ian, as always, it's great to get your knowledge on what's happening, all the machinations of the election, and there's a long way to go, seven weeks, but I'm sure we're going to see lots more of you over the um, political... Um, campaign for the next seven weeks and I really appreciate it appearing on the point here and again this morning. Thanks Keith, I look forward to it. Thank you.